Um, good afternoon, my name is Brian Miller and this is my pal. William Kankwamba, I'm from Malawi. Malawi is in Southeast Africa, bordered by Mozambique, Tanzania and Zambia. So, uh, this is the view of where I come from, Wimbe village. This picture is taken behind my house. This is how it looked like. Uh, I grew up in the family of uh, seven children, all sisters excepting me. Growing up, you can imagine the challenges I went through at school. The bullies were picking on me. They said that I didn't have a older brother to protect me, but anyway, I survived from them. Um, this is me when I was a boy with my, my dad. Malawi is an agricultural country. Um, we grew maize, a little bit of tobacco, soya beans, and the potatoes. Like everyone else, my family also grew maize. We grew maize to live, never for profit. Living such a way is very dangerous. It is very dangerous, especially when you have an acre of maize like William's family did, and that's your whole food for the year. Um, uh, in a such a situation, uh, any hitch in the weather, such as rain or drought or the price of seed and fertilizer, can push you over into hunger. And uh, that's exactly what happened in the year 2000. A big drought swept over Malawi. And instead of harvesting 20 bags of maize, uh, like they normally do, William's family only harvested three. And it was much worse throughout the countryside. Normally when this happens, the uh, government will come and they'll put some emergency grain on the market and allow people to get a leg up until their next harvest. But this particular year, um, some corrupt officials and government sold all that maize for their own profit and people quickly ran out of food. And when this happened, famine swept over Malawi and uh, in five months, over 10,000 people had starved to death. So, uh, like uh, everyone else, also my family was badly affected with the famine. Uh, my, my family was forced to eat one meal per day, only at night. Uh, three swallows of umsima for each one of us. Uh, we dropped down to nothing. So, um, in Malawi, high schools, you have to pay for school fees. It was the same year when I was supposed to start a high school. Because of the hunger, my parents didn't have any money to send me to school. So I was forced to drop out of school. When I had to drop out of school, I looked at my father and looking all those dry food. It was the future I couldn't imagine, I couldn't accept. So I was determined to do everything possible to receive education. In order to continue with my studies, I decided to go to library to start reading books. I was most interested in reading science books, uh, physics books, even though by that time I couldn't read English that well. So I was using diagrams and pictures to learn the words around them. Uh, my favorite topic was electromagnetics and I learned how it works. The, other book put that knowledge on in my hand, said when we could pump water and generate electricity. Pump water for me meant irrigation for a second crop, a defense against hunger. I said, if this window is in this book, it means that somewhere else somebody built it. Also me, I can do the same thing, I can build this window. But I didn't have any money to buy materials to build my window. So I went to a junkyard. Going to the junkyard, William began searching in the tall grass for his pieces. At 14 years old, he, found, he managed to find a, uh, a tractor fan, which he used for the rotor of the windmill. He then found a shock absorber, which he used for the shaft of his windmill. His father's bicycle became the frame of his windmill. And uh, using PVC pipe from a bathhouse, he cut it down the middle with a bow saw, melted it over a campfire, and uh, were able to um, flatten it out into blades. So when I was doing this, uh, many people, including my mom, thought that I was crazy. They said that, they said that I was smoking marijuana too much. <laughs> but even though he was teased and bullied, William persisted because he knew that if he built this windmill, it would save his family from darkness and hunger. The last piece that he had to get was a bicycle dynamo, a generator. Uh, he had everything else but except this one thing. And there came a day that he actually got this bicycle dynamo and he got it in his hands and he ran home. He put the bicycle dynamo on top of uh, 
the windmill. He climbed the, the, the tower, put the bicycle on top of the windmill, released its blades, and when he did it, a crowd below began to cheer when a light bulb yes. went up in his hand. So then I let Bob uh, turn one. Now I could read at night. I was able to read at night. So secondly, my cousin gave me a car battery. Using a car battery, I was installing enough power. So I, after I get the car battery, I add up uh, four light bulbs. I also built a uh, light switch so that when I'm turning, I should have a machine to turn off and turn light the, the, the electricity. Uh, my light switch was made out of PVC pipes and uh, flip flap labbers for the uh, buttons of the switch. I also made the circuit breaker, which was used to protect my house from being when there's short circuit, when the wires were crossed together. I used the nails and the, uh, a magnet from a stereo speaker. So when I did, peep, I did this, a lot of people started coming to charge their mobile phones. I couldn't get rid of them. <laughs> Also, did the, the journalists did the same thing. They wrote an article which led to bloggers and which led to a call from something called TED. I didn't know what TED was that time. So when I was invited to attend a TED conference in Arusha, Tanzania, at the stage I was so nervous, uh, my English disappeared. I, think, I remember I said one word like, I tried and I made it. It was my first time to see the airplane it was my first time to sleep in a hotel. Everything was the first time for me. I remember someone asked me, have we ever used the internet? I said, no. Do you know Google? I say, what animal is Google? <laughs> he explained to me that Google, you can search everything and get information of different things. When I typed Google, I was amazed to find many results of, of windmills, and then I said, where was this Google all this time when I was trying to build my window? <laughs> so. People in the audience were so moved by William's speech that many of them came up and offered to help him uh, in his village. So what William did is he went home and uh, the first thing he did was he put iron sheets on the roof so now the rain didn't leak through their grass uh, ceilings. Um, he also built a second windmill that was able to pump water from a shallow well that gave his mom enough uh, irrigation to... Uh, have a vegetable garden that they could uh, eat year-round and uh, also sell in the market. We also drew the uh, deep well, deep well boho using the solar pump. Now we can pump water and the, we have a running water. Before this time, William's mom was spending about two hours every day going to a local water pump uh, about a mile away from the house with many buckets. She would go and she would pump and wait in line with the women and then have to haul the buckets back. And once William uh, was able to drill this borehole, um, they installed six faucets around his village. And now women and people can come from all over the area, and it's the only clean drinking water for 60 miles around. Uh, we also set up the irrigation system. Now my parents can, can plant three times a year. We no longer ho go hungry again. I'm also at school right now. I'm attending a school in Johannesburg, South Africa at African Leadership Academy. At school right now, I'm working on designing a low-cost machine that can be used to drill uh, wells so that many people in uh, different areas, they can have access to clean water. If, if God gives us water underneath the ground we are living on, it's our duty to find the ways how to take it. We don't need to wait for the government or the aid organization to do it, to do it for us. Clean water, Eric Tisse, it's our rights. Thank you. <laughs>